Oh, well. I didn't see you waving your branches too much during worship. I guess that's kind of new to some of you. Or it means you're going to wave them during the sermon. I don't, I don't even know why this one's still in my hand. Mm. Put it right there. Okay. So, last week, I don't know about you, but I was kind of surprised at how forceful the sermon came out. I mean, that seems kind of weird, doesn't it? You practice it one way and it comes out another. I don't know. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit. Several of you have said that the sermon was good or that it spoke to you in some way. Maybe that's the way God wanted it. Or maybe it was my flesh, right? I had to leave the music twice last week to go outside and cough, and that was a little frustrating. And there was that obvious lack of enthusiasm for answering my questions at the beginning of the sermon. I could see in a person like me that the natural response would be to get more passionate, trying to grab your attention. Oh well. In any case, I hope you didn't miss the point of the sermon. The point of the sermon was that part one of God's plan for restoring sinful people to himself is repentant confession. That means when you realize that you've turned away from God and you've gone down this wrong path of sin, at any time you can turn back to God with the intention of walking forward with him instead of returning to that sin. That's called repentance. And then we acknowledge that we were wrong, that we sinned against God. That's confession. Okay? When we do that, God is standing there with open arms, ready to welcome us back, to shower us with his love and grace and mercy. This is how we get right with God after we sin. My somewhat passionate elaboration last week of all the ways that we might do this wrong, our approaches in the flesh was to show that our natural instincts about how to respond to temptation and sin can be faulty. So we have to learn the biblical techniques of resisting temptation and the biblical approach to returning to God, which is repentant confession. So today we're going to learn the rest of God's plan for dealing with sin and reconciling people to himself. Let me pray, and then we'll get to it. Jesus, thank you for what this week symbolizes to us. Palm Sunday, the day that you triumphantly rode into Jerusalem for the last time on that donkey, and the people waving palm branches and throwing them in front of you and shouting, Hosanna, save us, save us, Lord, save us, please. In that moment, they recognized who you were, but then a a few days later, Most of the people were cheering as you were nailed to a cross. We know you had victory in the end. On the third day, you rose from the dead, victorious over sin and death and evil, able to resurrect us as well. And that's the hope we have. Thank you for this week and for this day. We pray that you would speak through the preacher this morning and touch our hearts and our minds. Use your word to speak into us. We pray, well, I was going to say in Jesus' name, but I'm praying to you, Jesus, so I'll just say thank you. Amen. So two weeks ago, we moved out of the literary setting of the Bible and into the crisis, right? We introduced the tension that drives the narrative forward. Somehow, Satan rebelled and gained control of a snake in the Garden of Eden. That snake spoke falsely about God's character, God's revelation, and the nature of the forbidden fruit. Eve was deceived, and she ate some. Adam, sitting idly by, not only didn't stop the snake or Eve, he went along and ate some too. The first result we saw was shame. Adam and Eve were now shrewd to the ways of evil, and they saw it in themselves as they had rebelled against God by eating this forbidden fruit. And so they felt shame. And in response, they wanted to cover their nakedness from each other with leaves and hide from God. When God confronted them about the situation, giving them the opportunity to repentantly confess, they instead tried to rationalize their sin by shifting the blame. So now we are on Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, if you have your Bible open. Let's see how our protagonist, our hero, God himself, is going to respond to this crisis. Genesis 3, 
Genesis chapter 3. We'll begin with 14 and 15. It says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. One aspect of God's response is judgment. God has all the authority in the universe and he is the ultimate power, right? He is the one, unique, eternal, creator, God. People, the serpent, even Satan, our real antagonists, are all created. They have no choice but to submit to God's judgment. Notice God doesn't even have to command judgment here. He simply proclaims it. If God says it, it will be so, just as in the creation process. God starts with the snake. Now, as I said before, it's It's remarkable that the text isn't interested in explaining why the snake has turned evil or how evil has arisen arisen in the paradise garden amidst God's pure and useful creation. But we know from later revelation in the Bible that Satan, an angel who had rebelled against God, came and spoke through the snake to lead Adam and Eve into rebellion as well. And so now God is going to speak against the snake, but he also will speak prophetically against Satan. Now, snakes don't eat dust, do they? Anyone know? No? My my daughter watches the Wild Kratts cartoon show. They teach you about animals. Snakes don't eat dust. And they probably always crawled around on the belly, despite what artists like to show us. But what we have here, most likely, is metaphor and wordplay. In verse 14, God humiliates the snake. The imagery is of sucking up the dust kicked up by the other animals. It's supposed to convey humility and defeat. Going along on its belly and writhing describes the cringing and vulnerability of a beaten foe. And this imagery will be a perpetual reminder for all of creation that the created creatures rebelled against the Creator. And perhaps it's fitting if the snake, which became shrewd in the hands of evil, somehow allowed that evil to have influence. The snake was shrewd, but now he always would be humble and vulnerable. It was tempted to evil, so it will eat dust. We're going to come back to verse 15 in a few minutes, and we'll also come back to what God means when he says, cursed are you above all. But first I want to go on to verse 16. To the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So there is judgment against the woman. Reproduction will now be severely painful as a process, but there is grace for the woman too. She was created in part to help reproduce the image of God throughout the earth. She still is fertile. She still can fulfill this part of her role as God's image. Now the second sentence here poses a bit of a translation problem, or at least a challenge. Some English translations, like the NIV, which I'm using today, make it sound like the woman would now desire her husband sexually. But that kind of ignores the context. It doesn't really fit, and it ignores the fact that she probably already had that desire as part of the inducement to reproduce God's image in the first place. The Hebrew text has no verb. It just says, toward your husband, your desire. Now, in the very next chapter of Genesis, the same construction is used. You see it at the bottom here, chapter 4, verse 7, where God tells Cain, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. And then in the same construction as our verse, it says, it desires to have you, literally toward you, its desire, but you must rule over it. Now, based on that clear meaning, Some English translations, like the NET, NLT, and your humble pastor, believe that God is saying to Eve that she will desire to control her husband. You see, in the process of committing that first sin, Eve led her husband, who was supposed to be head of the household. And so God is declaring that now she would want to be first. But not only would the man lead her, he would rule or dominate over her. It is clear that 
that male dominance became the norm in the household. We'll see that in a few chapters in our Bible story. We can see it as we look around the world today. Some men do become passive, and they allow their wife to rule the household, but those who do not often have a sinful tendency to become arbitrary, self-indulgent, even abusive autocrats, rather than the loving, sacrificial, and selfless leaders of the partnership God wanted men and women to enjoy. So thus, the household of people would have division, not unity. They would have guardedness, not openness, in a perpetual reminder of the family's rebellion against God, of willingly giving up their place as his image. Verse 17. To Adam, God said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Because his image bearers rebelled against him, God cursed the earth. Earlier we saw the snake would be the most cursed of all the animals, but indeed all animals would be cursed, both with physical death and with suffering in a corrupted environment. Now some of their suffering is due to the corruption of the human race and our willingness our submission to satan's rule here but some of their suffering is due to god's judgment on mankind for sin again we see god respond with both judgment and grace because man sinned by eating what was forbidden to eat he no longer would have easy pickings but he still would eat man now would have to work the fields to produce food but the ground would produce obstructive weeds among the crops, and the crops would be susceptible to weather and uncertain provision. The land would be less fertile, and it would be outside of the garden paradise. As the woman would have painful toil, eats of own in Hebrew, during childbirth, so the man would have painful toil, eats of own during his work. I love that parallelism. Now the man would have to strain just to feed his family. Now this might not speak to us as much today as it did in the past, but consider up until about 120 years ago, it was quite common even in this country for people to struggle just to survive. This affluence that we have now is unusual by historical standards. And we have many farmers among us, and I'm sure they can tell you that we have some of this affluence because we've learned somewhat to mitigate God's curse. We have crop rotation and pesticides and fertilizers. We had to invent all that to get around the problems created by this curse. But the curse is still there. Instead of creation submitting to man's rule, it would resist him, and indeed it would swallow him up upon physical death. God had threatened to bring physical death upon people if they rebelled by eating this fruit, and here he reiterates that. And God reminded Adam that he had taken Adam, created him out of the dirt, and now to the dirt he would be destined. You are dust, says God. Not you are my beloved image bearer. You are dust, a created thing. Not even something beautiful and elegant, but the dust that the snake would eat. If you think about it, that's one of the worst insults in all of the Bible right there. God's wrath is terrible here. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. They wanted to be in that top circle, but they lost everything. Their spiritual life and intimacy with God, their physical life and quality of life, and the opportunity to rule here in God's name. And none of this could be undone by Adam and Eve. They would suffer the consequences of their sin their whole lives. And the worst part for us is these curses are handed down generation to generation, right? We can see that just by observing the conditions in our world or our society. 
because of this event, which we call the fall, okay, the fall into sin and corruption, we inherit corruption in our human nature. And thus we are born spiritually dead, separated from God, predisposed toward rebellion and sinful actions, and without God's intervention, destined for hell, which is an eternal separation from God. The Bible later reveals that we inherit from our parents a blinded intellect, an evil and idolatrous heart, defiled emotions, passions, behavior, and character, and an enslaved will. It breaks my heart to know that I've passed that on to my little girl. Also, because of this event, which we call the fall, God holds all people accountable for the human race going rogue back in the Garden of Eden. And so he carries out his original threat of physical death for all people. Another effect of the fall is that instead of people reigning in God's name, evil now reigns on the earth. Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world for now, referring to the fact that Satan lured Adam and Eve into giving up their right to rule, their reign of the earth, when they chose to follow him instead of God. Satan and his demons are only restrained on the earth somewhat by the Holy Spirit, just enough so God's work can be done. All right, that's pretty heavy stuff, all that judgment, even with a little grace mixed in. But here it gets better, okay? This is where it gets good. Verses 20 and 21. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So we have three things to discuss here. First, the promise God made back in verse 15. Second, Adam's response to that promise here in verse 20. And third, God's first step toward fulfilling that promise in verse 21. In a sermon filled with big ideas, these are the biggest. So if you've drifted off into la-la land, tune back in. Give me 15 minutes, you'll learn something good. There is a poetic literary technique in verses 9 through 19 called a chiasm. The topics, as you can see, there are man, woman, serpent, then it goes back to woman, and it goes back to man. And in a chiasm, the emphasis is on whatever's in the middle. In this case, verses 14 and 15, which, in which God announces the perpetual struggle and his solution to that crisis. In verse 14, we saw God judged the snake, right? But in verse 15, God turns to the real power behind that snake, Satan, or the devil. God used this pattern several times in Scripture. For example, God had Ezekiel prophesy against the human ruler of the state of Tyre, and then against Satan as the real power behind that evil ruler. God had Isaiah prophesy against the nation of Babylon, and then against Satan as the real power behind that evil empire. In Genesis 3.15, God said to Satan, the evil power behind the snake's treachery, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, the NIV uses the term offspring here, so the average reader will understand, but in Hebrew, zerah means seed, okay? He's talking about the seed of the woman. This verse is called the Proto-Evangelium, which means it's the first gospel promise. Even in this terrible moment of God's wrath and judgment, God provided hope. He always does, okay? So if you're hearing something in your head that seems condemning and it doesn't come with hope, that's not God's voice that you're hearing. Satan had deceived and tempted the woman away from God. But now God says that he's going to woo the woman back, even to the point where she'll be hostile towards Satan. So Satan may have seized control of the world and corrupted all of humanity, but he wouldn't control all of humanity. God also promised that those whom Satan had influenced for evil, including the fallen angels that we call demons, demons, 
and the people walking in spiritual darkness, they would face hostility from those descendants of the woman, her plural seed, who were procreated to live as the image of God. And thus Satan's reign on the earth would always be opposed by God's people. And God promised that one day, one of the woman's offspring, her singular seed, would destroy Satan, though Satan also would kill that man, striking his heel in the metaphorical imagery of the snake. This is the first promise of the Savior, that a man, the seed of the woman, would come to defeat Satan. Ultimately, this is the protagonist's plan, God's plan, to overcome the literary tension or crisis. He will send a deliverer to conquer Satan and all evil and somehow set things right again. Paul reminds us of this in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. He says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now, consider Adam's response in verse 20 to God's promise in verse 15. Do you remember what Adam was calling his wife? Up until now, he's been calling her Isha which became the Hebrew word for woman. But now Adam named his wife Eve. Actually, he didn't. He named her Chva. But we don't like to clear our throats when we talk, so we call her Eve after the Latin translation of Chva. But Eve, or Chva, is related to the ancient Hebraic verb to live. And based on similar usage in, in Ugaritic and Phoenician, we think it means life giver. And that would make sense, right? Because the text says Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. But now think about this. She hasn't had a child yet. She and Adam have just received a death sentence from God, right? But Adam could name her life giver because he trusted that she would procreate God's image and continue to fulfill the purposes God had given them. Because Adam had faith and hope. He believed in the promise in verse 15, not only of a Savior, but that the Savior would be the seed of the woman. Adam is back on what we call the top line in this church. He's walking by faith and obedience. This promise of the human Savior was cherished. It was passed down from generation to generation such that when Cain and Noah were born, And when Isaac was offered for sacrifice, their parents wondered if they were this promised seed of the woman. Verse 21 is God's first step towards fulfilling his promise. And we learn back in verse 7 that Adam and Eve felt shame. They felt vulnerable about being naked, so they instinctively clothed themselves with fig leaves. They had to use plant matter because there was no death yet. They weren't allowed to kill an animal. They couldn't eat animals. They couldn't kill a pig to make a football. They couldn't kill something fuzzy to make clothing. But God wanted to cover their sin, not just their nakedness. Mankind's effort of fig leaves and hiding was inadequate. God's plan involved repentant confession and animal sacrifice. This is how God dealt with their guilt. This is his method for delivering them and forgiving them. Animal sacrifice, shed blood, would temporarily atone. That is, it would temporarily make peace with God. It would temporarily appease God's wrath about sin. God would allow death to come upon the animal as a temporary and symbolic punishment for people's sin. I mean, all right, the the clothing might not have been stylish leather, right? But think about who our God is. Maybe it was. Who knows? Could have dressed him like that. He probably didn't have a motorcycle. Picture a camel. That's all I'm saying. The custom of sacrificing animals would have been handed down generation to generation too. We see Abel keeping flocks. We see sacrifice with Noah, Abraham, and their descendants, even right up to Moses and his people before the exodus from Egypt. God later codified animal sacrifice into the Mosaic covenant he made with Israel just before they entered the promised land. 
Animal sacrifice was a temporary atonement which foreshadowed what would happen with the promised Savior. When Satan struck the Savior, killing him as it happened on the cross, in that moment, Jesus took all our punishment for sin from God the Father. As awful as he suffered physically and emotionally leading up to that moment, that moment of death was much worse as he bore all of our sin and God's wrath for our sin. That's worth some sober contemplation today or this week as we approach Good Friday. But we also should rejoice, right? One reason churches like to celebrate Palm Sunday, and if you have your palm, wave it so I know you're awake. All right, come on. Come on, show me. All right, that's, well, 30, 40, 50%. Okay. One reason we celebrate Palm Sunday is that it's a rejoicing day. And even though the death of anybody is sad, the death of the Savior particularly sad, it's actually good news for us, right? The sacrifice of the Savior provides everlasting atonement. That is everlasting peace with God, everlasting appeasement of God's wrath. And this leads God to forgiving us, which leads God to declaring us to be righteous in his sight, which leads God to reconciling with us, adopting us into his family, and giving us everlasting life. All of that is what we call good news. Let's finish our text. Verses 22 through 24. And the Lord God said, apparently to himself, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So God shows a little bit of his sense of irony here. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. That was one reason they ate this fruit. And now God says that's a good reason to expel them from the garden paradise. We talked about the tree of life before. It's unclear exactly how this worked, but somehow eating of it could sustain physical life. And since God was bringing the judgment of physical death on all people, he didn't want them to have access to that tree, and so he expelled them from the garden. Outside the garden, man would begin his work of cultivating the hostile ground, and the garden would be supernaturally guarded by angelic sentries, literally cherubim, of which Satan was one. He wasn't one of the guards. He was a cherubim (laughs) before he fell. Note that God provided the grace of gospel promise and sacrifice before he expelled people, banished them from the garden. God always provides a reason for hope. Again, if you're feeling hopeless, then you're being deceived either by your own system, okay, because we can get depressed, we can get morose, or by something supernaturally evil, or maybe something in the world. But God always, always will provide hope. So if you're feeling hopeless, come back and look at the promises of God in Scripture, and don't be afraid to call somebody else in this church, including me, for help. All right, let me summarize, and then we'll finish up. Adam and Eve sought extra freedom. But they actually lost it all because now they were in bondage to sin, to death, and to evil. Sin brought people from life to death, from pleasure to pain, abundance to scarcity and toil, harmony and intimacy to alienation and conflict, innocence to guilt, joy to fear and shame, purity to corruption. Sin is no friend of ours. God's response to this crisis was partly judgment. His curse would allow evil to have its time to reign, removing the guarantees of fertility and harmony, forcing people to choose between following God and following Satan, of living on the top line by submission and dependence to God's revelation, or living on the bottom line in rebellion and sin. And either way, people would face struggle just to survive. God's plan for resolving this crisis had three parts. First, God allowed repentant confession so that 
people could be restored into relationship with him. Second, God allowed animal sacrifice to temporarily atone, temporarily make peace with him, to appease his wrath. Third, God provided the promise of the coming Savior, the one we know as the Messiah or Christ. Both words mean the anointed one. He would come to defeat Satan and destroy sin, death, and evil by becoming the permanent sacrifice and bearing the burden of all of our sin and all of our punishment for sin so that we could be restored to God permanently. So despite the bleak situation in our story at this point, we can't give up hope as readers either because Yahweh, the hero, the literary protagonist, has a plan. He's still in control. He still has a plan to establish a representative people for himself. And he's implemented a plan for the salvation of individual people who will learn to trust and thus obey. And that plan also involves the ultimate salvation of all of creation to be restored from freedom to freedom from sin, death, and evil. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you have a plan. That even back then in that moment, you had a plan. And that your plan didn't involve wiping out the human race, but rather saving us. We are thankful for your grace. Each of us has also sinned. We each have also rebelled against you too frequently, too many times in our lives. And we know we can't make that up. We know we can never deserve to be with you. We can never be worthy of being your image. We can never earn forgiveness. And yet you had a plan that was filled with grace and mercy and love. And so you welcome us back when we put our faith in Jesus, when we repentantly confess our sins day to day. Even as believers, sometimes we rebel. We thank you, God, for that today. We thank you that Jesus came. We thank you for what this week means, for his death and resurrection. And we look forward to when he comes again and will reign as king over the earth and put an end to evil and sin and suffering. And we pray that our worship service today could glorify you. And we pray especially for the little kids. We thank you so much for them as a blessing and that they were willing to march around and sing songs for us this week. We pray that you bless them with your grace, that they can have saving faith. We pray that for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.